everything. Um, welcome everyone to this Iris Hub topical meeting. Today is going to be about uh, inference with Triton at Fermilab. And um, I'm very happy that we have here a few experts who have gone through setting up and, and using Triton. So we have uh, Bert and Lindsay here from Fermilab, Fermilab staff, and uh, Claire, who is a PhD student at uh, Colorado Boulder, who will work us through how they have set up and how they're using um, Triton at Fermilab. It's an interesting topic for Iris Hub um, currently, uh, as we're looking into integrating some of that, for example, into the analysis grant challenge. So looking forward to uh, you taking over to walk us through that and then uh, going into questions and comments that, uh, and have a discussion about what you showed. And then with that, please take it away. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'll give a few introductory slides over uh, what a, what exactly all the parts of this are and some of the technical details. And then we'll have uh, Claire show off the demonstration of using all of that in uh, her analysis and going through step by step how you actually use this thing and apply it within uh, within a functioning analysis and uh, take advantage of the uh, scaling of the or the automatic scaling of the GPUs and things like that. So uh, just to give some uh, locating information about uh, what the EAF is, so that stands for the Elastic Analysis Facility, and it's uh, located here at Fermilab. Anyone with a uh, Fermilab computing account can use it, uh, and it is multi-VO and services uh, all the experiments at the lab which was the uh, first thing that kind of set it apart from uh, thing uh, from Copy Casa or some of the other uh, analysis facility uh, uh, efforts that are out there. Um, and so far we've got it up so that it's uh, working or working in that capacity and you can indeed access uh, securely different varieties of data depending on the virtual organization that you log in with. Um, and we're very shortly going to be switching it uh, piecewise into uh, production mode so that it, uh, there's an established resource base for people to user or for users to ask uh, questions about and uh, uh, general uh, consolidated knowledge to draw upon as to how to use this thing. And of course, the usual guarantees of uh, being highly available and uh, well supported. Um, so I think the uh, Everyone's used to seeing the uh, uh, the two blocks in the middle here about the ecosystem that we use uh, within, especially with an iris hep, and then kind of the overall uh, uh, shape of what an analysis uh, analysis facility looks like. And uh, the additional complexity for the EAF really comes from everything outside of that that you see. Uh, peppered around here, in particular, needing to support multiple kinds uh, mo or multiple experimental software stacks, needing to make sure that uh, data cannot be read between experiments, uh, that if you're a part of multiple experiments, that you can log in with the correct credentials and have that map correctly to the different computing environments available at Fermilab. And then Similarly, we have a variety of different kinds of substrates that are out there that we bind all together to make the computing uh, the computing environment coherent, um, predominantly using uh, OpenShift and Docker containers to make sure that we have reproducible and highly accessible uh, uh, coding and uh, uh, data processing environments. And we uh, put it all together using the typical um, Jupyter Hub front end. So when you drop into the Elastic Analysis Facility, uh, you're presented with all the possible options for uh, different kinds of experiments and different basic software stacks that uh, can be run in the EAF. And depending on what you uh, what you select, you get the appropriate software stack for the kind of uh, or sorry for the uh, experimental area within Fermilab that you want to be a part of. And you can see already um, within some of uh, some of these uh, options that there are GPUs of various kinds available, um, and <coughs> and what we're provide or so far and correct me if I'm wrong, Bert. What we're providing is something next to this that allows access to more uh, 
powerful GPUs in a scalable way. And that takes us to talking about NVIDIA Triton a little bit. So there's uh, two ways predominantly of uh, scaling ML inference when you're using it in an analysis. So you can either have a direct inference where this, the batch job that you're running is on a computer that has a GPU uh, connected to a PCI Express, uh, Express port in the uh, server that you're using. Um, and so here you can imagine just uh, booting up PyTorch or something like that inside of your analysis job, uh, taking over the GPU as you need and performing, uh, performing the calculations you need on it. Uh, this can have some uh, efficiency issues, though, because you, as you can imagine, modern GPUs are fairly powerful. And a single analysis, especially if it's just running something like a, uh, a simple classifier or something like that, that's not, or uh, something that's not a GNN, uh, will starve the GPU uh, for data fairly quickly because you're just not providing enough of it, especially with the high bandwidths that are possible uh, with all the uh, on-system buses. Um, the other way uh, is to try to provide the GPUs more as a service and in particular specialize it for running machine learning inference so that you can try to optimize any of the transport uh, to and from the machine that's making the request for the inference to the machine that's actually running the inference. And this pleasantly uh, decouples your uh, uh, the number of clients that you can run from the number of servers that you may need uh, that have GPUs on them. And through that, you can find a better balance of uh, the number of uh, workers that are generating data to perform inference on versus the number of uh, GPUs you actually need. And uh, this is accomplished through a piece of software that's provided by NVIDIA called the uh, Triton Inference Server. And uh, despite the fact that it has NVIDIA slapped on it, uh, I wouldn't worry about vendor lock too much because they also do have, you know, a version of this that works on AM, uh, AMD through Rockham. And you can, uh, you can use different kinds of GPUs with it. So it's, it's more about scaling the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, scaling, uh, scaling the inference and the, all the different technologies behind that. Uh, so this inference server supports uh, essentially all of the uh, modern, all of the modern machine learning frameworks. So uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, ONNX. It also supports uh, uh, older or uh, older uh, uh, machine learning techniques like uh, BDTs, uh, uh, and also those in a variety of formats uh, from uh, from XGBoost to Microsoft's. Uh, uh, tree forest format as well. So you can accelerate on GPUs or otherwise offload the inference of a huge variety of machine learning models uh, from BDTs all the way to cutting edge graph neural networks uh, by using the software and make it so that you don't have to use the resources of a local GPU and wait, uh, wait accordingly for the batch schedule for, or the batch scheduler for that. So we should be able to mix and match and find the right pairing of uh, data generators to data processors, if you're gonna think about it that way, and uh, get a more efficient model for the computing in this case. Uh, so just some technical details. Uh, the Triton inference server serves as a uh, way to kind of abstract away a lot of the uh, specifics of the machine learning model and the processor that you're ex or the kind of processor that you're executing it on. So it contains within it uh, different machine learning backends, like I mentioned, PyTorch and ONNX and uh, TensorFlow, et cetera. And you can also write your own if you have some specific alg some algorithm that you would like to evaluate as a service. And this has already been done for uh, CMS's PataTrack and a few other things. Uh, just to name some examples there. And so you can take algorithms that would otherwise be in your framework that you would like to run on a GPU and still scale it out this way. And within the Triton inference server, it handles all of the requests from users uh, and returning the appropriate results in the correct order. Uh, and within itself, it's able to uh, 
uh, optimize and redo batching in real time so that you can get the best GPU usage out of it. Uh, and then it has uh, uh, some analysis of what models are being requested uh, and are the most popular so that it keeps them in GPU memory the most often so that it doesn't have to spend time reloading models every time there's a new, uh, yes, every time there's a new uh, uh, request being made. And then uh, on top of that, and we'll see this in the next slide, there's also a um, model repository next to all of this that just contains the description of the models themselves in a serialized form and all of the metadata about the information that they return uh, or receive in return. Uh, so using it at Fermilab looks sort of like this. So there's a GRP or a secure GRPC uh, that we have uh, that's uh, sent to a load balancer. And then you have a stack of Triton servers that have uh, GPUs behind them. And in our case, we're using NVIDIA A100 hundreds that have been sliced up using the multi-instance GPU feature of those uh, of those uh, graphics cards. And uh, this pod of Triton servers is talking to a uh, MinIO instance that contains within it in its object store the, <coughs> excuse me, that contains within it the uh, list of models for each user and each user can uh, say what models they'd like loaded into the Triton server. And so, uh, and then there's monitoring and uh, feedback systems throughout this to help uh, debug or help debug problems and make sure that there's good user feedback. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so the what the user sees uh, in particular to uh, hiding all of this complexity is really the interface asking for the or asking for in a specific. Uh, uh, inference from a specific model and providing data to and from that through gRPC. And then the uh, S3 web console, which allows you to upload uh, upload and define models uh, that can then be picked up by the Triton servers and then served for you to, uh, to do your analysis. So giving that overview, uh, we'll switch over to Claire now and she'll be giving you a demo of how all of this works in, uh, in a real analysis and what it, what it really feels like from the user perspective to get things done using the software stack. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just any questions. Uh, so uh, we can take our time with discussion. And if there's any initial technical or uh, questions otherwise, uh, let's go ahead. If there's any, like, feel free to either unmute or raise your hand. We're not too many people, so we might manage. I, I have one myself. You mentioned mm -hmm. the possibility or like the, the, the fact that you're using CMS pattern track, or I forgot what it's called in there. So does this mean you can kind of put any custom workload in there and it doesn't have to be some inference necessarily? It can really be anything that is accessible uh, on, on GPUs? Yeah, so uh, you can really, if you can, shim it into the interface that they provide uh, where you have to define, you know, the, the width of the input columns and kind of make it look like uh, an ML inference. And actually, I think that's getting relaxed day by day um, as they make more releases. Uh, you can put any algorithm behind it that you would like. Okay, yeah, so concretely, for example, if I'm thinking now I have some fit that I wanna run that really doesn't need much uh, input wise, Right, it's just like it needs to run the minimization, and perhaps like this is something that I could easily force into some column format the the inputs that I do want to control. So I guess it, I I just don't know to what extent this is sort of abusing the interface a bit, um, and there would be like a, a better option like some func x function as a service more generic kind of approach, or whether there's still a sort of reasonably usable um, with that. Uh, it's. I, I don't know how much overhead it is with respect to FunkX, but it's actually very similar to, uh, to FunkX, except it's very focused on uh, allocating and providing GPUs as the, un or GPUs or other accelerators as the underlying resource, uh, so long as you conform to the gRPC protocol they've, uh, they've defined. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions for this initial part here?
Okay, then perhaps let's continue and we can come back to questions uh, again later on. Yeah, okay, so I, I'm gonna take over from here and, and show the demo that I've set up. Um, so what I'm gonna be showing essentially is how to use the machine, uh, a machine learning model that I've been working with for uh, an emerging JETS analysis for CMS. Um, so I'm just gonna start with a, a brief overview of emerging JETS. So, um, it's a dark matter signature that produces uh, two dark mediator pairs, which each decay to a standard model and a dark quark. Um, and the standard model quark then goes to uh, general standard QCD jets, and our dark quark um, turns into dark pions, which travel some measurable distance in the detector um, to then go back into standard model quarks. Um, and the collection of our standard model quarks, which are coming from these dark pions, form some jets in our detector that kind of emerge, uh, which is what we're seeing in this schematic here. And so this is what we call our emerging jets. Um, so previously, uh, our, our old analysis on run one data used a cut-based tagger, um, which is essentially just making simple cuts on jet level variables to distinguish between our EMJs and our background QCD jets. Um, and so the current analysis is exploring the application of a graph neural network to use to do the EMJ tagging as opposed to a cut based tagger. So that's uh, the motivation we have here. Now, currently, our analysis computing structure is as follows. So um, it's built for the uh, FNAL LPC CPUs. Um, so we log into an LPC login node, and then we use a Dask coffee, uh, coffee processor to submit jobs to um, LPC CPU workers. And so each of these workers has a copy of all of our analysis code and runs over the analysis code on separate data, data slash Monte Carlo files accessed through EOS. So an important note here is that everything is currently set up and runs on CPUs. Um, the problem with that is that many machine learning models, including uh, the EMJ graph neural network model that we're working with, um, which is based off of particle net, um, runs a lot slower on CPUs than it does on GPUs. So uh, what we wanted to do was then make use of um, the Triton server to kind of place the GPU onto a, uh, onto, sorry, place the models onto the GPUs and then start up a client um, from the uh, CPU side, the worker side, and then uh, ping the servers to do this inference. So the next two sections um, are gonna be two different uh, parts of the demo. Um, the first part here is just going to be converting our model, which is our EMJ graph neural net tagger, and uploading it to the um, EAF Triton server. And then we're going to start the client and ping the Triton server, and then use this server for inference. So uh, we start by loading in the model that we want to use. So here I've got um, my EMJ tagger class, which uh, loads in an instance of this tagger that I'm working with. Um, and then I uh, load in that model, I set it to evaluate. So what we're seeing here, actually I realize I should, oh, I, sorry, let me run all of these cells. Okay, so what we're seeing that we have loaded in currently is what I'm calling my local model. So it's the model that's just on this login mode a login node on the LPC that I'm, I'm in right now. Um, so this is very similar to particle net, what, what I'm working with here. Um, so yeah, we've got this already. And then to upload this model to the Triton server. Um, so this model is currently uses, currently uses PyTorch as a backend. Um, we need to convert it with JIT and then uh, include some configuration files so that the, the Triton server knows um, exactly what is going on with this model. So here's an example of how you would it, convert it with JIT. Um, there might be a little bit of tweaking in the, the class in order to do this conversion, um, or at least what I've seen with uh, working with the model that I've had. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, once this is converted, you can save the jitted model, and then that will be uploaded into the container uh, that um, that Lindsay had talked about before. So the container, I have a, a link to the container in the notebook if you want to look at it. Um, the container looks like this. So in here, we've got our Triton models container and, and all the Triton models uh, that are currently available to be used by the Triton server are here. So we're working with the EMJ graph neural net unflavored um, container. And so as you can see, when we look in here, we've got configuration files. I'll go a bit more into what's in these configuration files. And then we've got our model stored in this uh, file labeled one. So that's what it looks like. You have to upload the model in the same structure. And these configuration files look a bit like this. So there's one configuration file that tells you um, essentially what your input looks like and what your output looks like. So here we see we've got uh, our points, which have dimensions to negative one features. So there's five features per jet. I'm sorry, five features uh, for the tracks in the jet. Um, we've got a mask as well, and then we've got two outputs. And then the second configuration file just gives the names of the two outputs. So fairly simple here. And then you upload that into the container. Um, one note is that you do need access to uh, either the Fermilab network, so you have to be at Fermilab, or you have to have access to the VPN in order to access this um, this Triton models container here. Okay, so next what we're gonna do now that it's uploaded, um, as we saw it's in there. Um, so now that it's uploaded in there, what we're gonna do is create an instance of this Triton model uh, so that we can use it. So first there's a class that needed to be created um, that actually creates this instance and links our uh, our CPU that we're working with with the Triton server onto the GPU. And so we've got this class that's created, um, which has just uh, two things. So one is just the initialization of the class, and this um, this creates our uh, our connection between the client and the server here. And then when we actually make the call, so when we do the inference, what we're seeing in this second part here, um, it converts our inputs into the proper format. Uh, it packages that data, as we see here. And then uh, it makes our uh, inference request here. And then you can retrieve that and return the output. So this is essentially just a wrapper to, uh, to work with Triton. Okay, so now that we have this, we're gonna create an instance of the Triton version um, with our EMJ graph neural net model. So uh, here, what we're doing is we're calling this wrapper class and we've got the uh, path to the uh, proper model on the Triton server here. So now let's use these models. We've got the local model and we've got the Triton model. So I'm just gonna create a random set of inputs here. Um, there's slightly different uh, slightly different format, whether you're using local or Triton. So I've made that change here, but I can run the local model here and our Triton model. And what we're seeing is that our results more or less match, which is great. We wanna see the same output for both of these models. So to monitor um, the inference that's happening on the Triton server side, there is a monitoring page that's set up there is a monitoring page that's set up, which I will show you right now. So what we see on this monitoring page on the top, um, we've got the raw inference count. So this is the amount of uh, requests or inferences that occur on the side of the Triton server. Um, we've got the number of, of instances of your model on the, uh, the Triton server side, which I'll talk a bit more about at the end of the demo. And then we've got the average queue time per inference request. So for all the requests that come in, how long does it take before the inference is done? And then we can also see further down on this monitoring page, 
you can see all of the models that we saw in that container, there was four of them, if you remember, um, that can be used by the train server. And so here we see that we got some inference requests from our, uh, our graph neural net unflavored. Um, so yeah, so this is a good way to see if everything is working well. Um, you can see if things have failed, you can see when things have succeeded. Um, yeah, and I'll talk a little more about this at the end, but this is a great way to, to make sure that everything is working correctly. Again, this is also something you need the Fermilab uh, VPN to access. Okay, great. So we're done with part one here of the demo um, where we just showed how to convert the model, um, where to upload it, and how to use it and that the outputs match. Are there any questions on this section? I do have uh, for myself, I don't see another hand uh, up. So regarding this uh, slight difference that you see here between the, the local and the Triton results, if you rerun this on Triton, do you get the same exact same results? Or potentially does this depend on which GPU this now gets assigned to, which I think in your case wouldn't be an issue, but I'm assuming in principle, there could be various GPUs that Triton talks to. So these numbers may in principle change when we run it. So when I put in the configuration file, I uh, put in the type of uh, that I use for our inputs. And so theoretically, if the type stays the same, which with the configuration file, it should, it should give you the same output. Um, so if I actually rerun this cell, I mean, I could keep rerunning this cell and check, but um, I believe it should give you the same output every time. The output will be slightly different between the Triton model and the local model, um, but that difference is very, very, very minor. Yeah, if I can tag on some things there, it 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 will depend to some extent on the floating point implementation on on the GPU that you're using and what rounding mode you've set the GPU to use. Um, so that that is causing some of the dis the differences that you're seeing here, but that's not going to change any statistical distributions or things like that. It'll, you'll just see shifting in per and on, on a per event basis. Uh, and you all, or depending, yeah, depending on how uh, numerically stable the matrices are that you've gotten out of your training, uh, you might see better reproducibility with one rounding mode over another, but that's something that you can set in the GPU at runtime. I, I don't know off the top of my head if you can do that from uh, the, the configuration files in Triton or if that needs to be set, uh, uh, set externally uh, using some environment variable or something like that. Um, though at the, at the very end of the day, uh, the floating point implementations on GPUs are ever so slightly different from what you have on CPUs. So there is almost always going to be a bit of a difference, especially if you don't have um, well-conditioned matrices inside of your ML model, which almost always happens. So this is, this is expected and it's really good that they're close. Um, yeah, thanks. The sort of the the like the effects in general indeed like I wouldn't expect them to be big. It would have to be a really bad coincidence with some events like shift across bin boundaries, and then you have some smoothing algorithm that then it, like acts differently and such to like really make a difference. It was yeah, I was curious more generally, but uh, yeah, that that does sound rather reassuring. Thanks. I definitely haven't seen any difference in. Uh how the model is running when I use Triton versus local in my analysis. So, um, okay. Yeah that's, yeah. that's also very good as, a, <laughs> as a extra proper reference. I had one more, one more thing I was curious about, uh, relating, uh, related to like the JIT compilation. So I'm not very experienced with PyTorch. Is there a reason this is like not done for the training? Because when you said that, like you, you're doing it here, it sounded a bit like this is then only for the inference part. Wouldn't that also speed up the training? Yeah, uh, so um oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, um, so so Triton the, the Triton inference server is actually not set up to do training. Um it's only set up for 
uh, for inference. And so I've actually done the training on a GPU separately. And then when I run this code within the analysis code um, and just do the inference, that's when I use the Triton server. Right. And for the for the training part that you did separately, um, is, is it beneficial there to also just in time compile for the training or is that just not an option or does it not make a difference? I, I can take that one. Um, so the it only makes a difference if you uh, much like with uh, awkward arrays or and Numba, uh, if you have a Python for loop explicitly inside of your uh, neural network model. Um, and you actually have to thunk to the interpreter because it does compile things and it will, uh, the JIT compiler can unroll loops and uh, put things in the machine code. Uh, so if, if you have like extensive Python logic inside of your neural network module, uh, module that's where it can help in training. But otherwise, uh, mostly in PyTorch, you're just uh, passing pointers to giant tensors to, uh, through various functions. And the overhead from doing that is extremely small. So for training, it it may not make much sense. For the inference, what it lets you do is package all of the logic and weights together in a uniformly executable package uh, that doesn't require any uh, any Python dependency. So it's just much lighter weight and easier to distribute. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that then yeah that that makes a lot of sense then. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this section? Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the second part of the demo. So um, here we're going to, uh, so, so here we're gonna show an example of how I've actually put this into the code for the EMJ analysis and how I've made it um, very easy to swap out different taggers. Um, and then I'm actually gonna compare uh, a timing metric between a cut-based tagger, a local CPU version of the graph neural network and the Triton server graph neural, ne uh, graph neural network taggers. So um, essentially what I've done is uh, in our analysis, each of the taggers that we have have this run tag um, function that is used to actually run the tagger on all of these events and these jets. And so I wanted to do the same thing with our, our tagger. So I've built um, this run tag, uh, this run tag function for the um, Triton server graph neural net, and I'll show what that looks like um, so that we can easily just swap out the tagger. Oops, sorry, so that we can easily just swap out the tagger that we use um, and keep everything else the same. So it's nice and simple essentially. So I'm going to start by loading in the three different types of taggers. So I've got my cut base tagger here. We just make a couple of cuts on all these jet, jet level variables. I've got um, a local graph neural net model. So this is just local on the CPU I'm using. And then I've got my Triton model here. And um, this EMJ graph neural net tagger class is a class that I wrote to kind of initialize all these models and set the paths and things like that. Um, so there's a lot under the hood there, but essentially I'm just creating an instance of this model. So now what I'm gonna do is load in uh, some sample of the data that we're looking at. So um, we are, uh, all of our data is stored on EOS. So we've got an EMJ sample that I'm working with. Um, we do use uh, coffee and awkward arrays for our um, analysis. So. Here I'm, I'm using nano events factory to load this into events. And then I match my tracks to my jets. So now my jets is a collection of all of the tracks associated. Okay, so I'm gonna start by running the cut base tagger. So with the cut base tagger, all of the jets are evaluated at the same time. So to compare the timing between the cut base tagger and the graph neural net models, I'm going to call run tag a few times on a varying number of jets. Um, and so what we're seeing here is uh, as we process all these events, um, I'm going to collect all this timing in the background. I'll plot that in the end. But for 1,000 events, uh, which is my full sample, we see that this runs in 0 0.035 seconds. OK, so 
for the graph neural net models, all of our jets are batched for inference. Um, we can't just send all of the jets at once. So uh, therefore, I'm taking a look here inside of what is in the run tag function for our graph neural net model. So essentially what we've got here, um, so I've just got a few things in the beginning um, that clean up our jets and uh, some variables used for timing measure. But here what we're doing is we're running over different batches. I've got my batch size set to 1024. Um, we put all of our data into the proper format, and then we actually do the inference. So here, this is the inference that's done locally with PyTorch. Um, so I do that inference on all of our all of the different jets. And what we can see here is that um, as we process through, processing through all the jets at the end, uh, which is 4,502 jets, takes 79 seconds, or almost 80 seconds, which is significantly longer than the cut based one. Okay, so this is local. So now let's take a look at uh, the same thing, but with our Triton model. So this essentially looks the same. The big difference is just how uh, the inference occurs. So this is really the only difference we see here. So as we run through the different batches, we see that instead of 80 seconds, what we were saying before, it takes 1.63 seconds um, to run through all 4,502 jets. So a significant improvement. Okay, so now let's take a look at some plots here. Um, this is just comparing all of these values. Oh, sorry, this is too big for the... <laughs> okay, this is too big here, but um, essentially what we can see uh, on the bottom, the X, we've got the number of jets that are processed. So 1,000 to about 5,000, 6,000. Um, and then our blue line is our cut base tagger. So the Y axis is the time that it took to process this number of jets. The green is our Triton server. And the orange is our uh, local graph neural network instance. So we do see that the cut base does do uh, better than our, our green. So our blue compared to our green, our graph neural net Triton. But we do see a significant improvement from our Triton server to our local. Now, of course, our cut base, um, it would be really great if our uh, Triton server, our green, did comparatively to our blue. Um, there is a trade-off there. The timing is a bit longer. But uh, in general, uh, the tagger performs better. Um, for the green, so there, there is a bit of a trade-off there. Now, this last plot I've got here is just a comparison specifically between the local model and the Triton model. So I've got a ratio plot on the bottom here. And um, essentially, we're seeing that the, uh, the local model is about 50 times slower than the Triton model. So very significant improvement here. And as you saw earlier, um, how I package this up, where I can just swap whatever tagger and uh, run the run tag. Similarly, uh, as if I were to use the cut base tagger, it's very simple to run. Um, and so, so, yeah, this is great improvement, and it's not that much additional code to, to add. OK, so this is, I've got one other. Um, section here, but uh, are there any questions on anything I've presented in this section? I have a quick question. Have you tested this with um, a bigger input set? So if does the, the transfer of data eventually overcome the, um, the runtime improvements? Yeah, so um, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest thing, which I'm, I'm going to touch on on the next thing, actually, that the biggest thing with running a lot of data is that you start to get a lot of uh, requests that end up in the queue for inference. Um, and so actually, this is a, a, a good segue and then into this. So, so I'll go ahead over this and then let me know if this has answered your question. Um, but uh, when you actually scale out to multiple workers, 
So right now I'm just pinging the Triton server from one CPU. Um, but uh, in general, I've got a lot of workers running and I want to ping the Triton server. And as my inference counts go up on the left here, you can see that the queue time for all of these uh, inference requests goes up a, a lot. In order to mitigate that and bring the queue time back down, um, you can actually, uh, the Triton server will up the instances of your Triton model um, to here we, it's gotten up to 16. So now the workers can ping 16 different servers. So our queue time goes down. Um, and that's ultimately the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that um, I've seen on my end is that uh, if you get to a point where you oversaturate or max out the number of instances that you can have because we have limited resources um, and then your queue time can't go down any further, that's when things start to get a bit backed up. Did that answer your question? Yeah, for the most part. So, so this is really awesome that, um, and this is called auto scaling uh, on the Triton server side. So this is really nice that this can happen. Um, and this is all dependent on uh, a threshold that you've set for the queue time. So the threshold you can see, well, you can't really tell what number it is, but it's at 300 uh, milliseconds in this example. Um, right now it's sent to 100 milliseconds. So you can see um, on this, this uh, page here, it's 100 milliseconds. And when it goes above that, it will start scaling out to other instances. Um, so something that is now going to start being tested as we have more and more users um, is, is uh, kind of this, this auto scaling and the queue time and, and how that's going to pan out with a lot of users. So that's going to be a really interesting thing to um, look at as we continue to work on this. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarification uh, that this uh, scaling behavior, so this isn't inherent to Triton, this is uh, this is Kubernetes, this is OpenShift. Um, so we are using a horizontal, I, you know, I don't want to get too far in the jargon, but uh, we're using capability Kubernetes to scale out based on an arbitrary metric that in this case we're pulling from the uh, if this queue time is something that comes out of NVIDIA's got its own little, you know, Prometheus scrapable uh, uh, metric server that lives along with it. So when we we scrape that and when it gets high enough uh, within whatever threshold that we set, then we'll scale up. And there's other knobs in terms of how quickly you scale up and down and so on. So this is adjustable. But to be clear, so that we're really scaling out the number of of, of actual servers of these pods that are running each Triton inference server. And they are in, and they're uh, uh, independent. You know, they're independent, and we're and we're throwing. And there's a engine engine X uh, uh, sitting in the front. Although most Kubernetes systems will have, you know, whatever load balance you like can can run in the front. So that's all I had on the demo side. Um, I'm happy to answer any further questions. So you mentioned that you are splitting up your A100 using MIG. Um, how do you determine how to split it up? I, I can, uh, so I guess I should take that. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So initially we started splitting up. So we wanted to maximize, uh, uh, this is a, since the analysis facility is a shared facility, right? We're running both. We have this auto scale inference server set up uh, as well as we allow people to fire up notebooks that uh, uh, that uh, that land on a on a MIG uh, uh, and, and occupy a MIG uh, node. Uh, so we wanted to so we started out trying to maximize the the utility. So we just sliced all the A100s up into ten gigabyte slices, figuring you know, and and let's see what happens. Um, what Claire, uh, so then Claire had a headache with the inference that uh, we were actually hitting out of memory with the inference. Uh, you know, it's important that in any of the stuff you have your client, uh, and we weren't really defending against errors very well on the, on the client side either. So it was causing all sorts of headaches. Uh, so we did two things. One is the client is a bit more robust. So 
I, there aren't any inference failures showing up since we increased the memory, but if there had been, it would do the retries properly. Uh, and so we, we skate, so we picked a number of, so we, we uh, I think right now we're running our A100s with two 20 gig uh, wide slices and th three 10 gig slices. And then we're going to reconfigure next week because I've now I have a request somebody has a model that uh, uh, they want to run some some training on something that needs more than 30. So we're going to reconfigure again. Uh, I, I think we'll just eventually we'll find a steady state that we're more or less happy with. Uh, it is uh, we don't want to we want to be a bit careful about when we do reconfigure because that is disruptive. We have to kick all the pods off the node uh, when we do that. So you're finding that it's the memory limitation as opposed to really the number of CUDA cores, which is a limiting factor? At the moment, now for, keep in mind, so for the inference case that Claire's presenting, um, it's, uh, we're, we're scaling out the number of, uh, uh, so first of all, her, yeah, her issue was memory. That's what we're, we're hitting out of memory. Um, you know, for inference, I think it's, uh, it's pretty happy, you know, it's an embarrassingly parallel problem. So, uh, uh, or at least that's how the model, that's how it evaluates the models, right? Uh, so uh, scaling out 10 uh, inference servers uh, is, you know, or whatever, scaling out uh, four, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be clear in my terminology. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure the scaling makes, if we scale out the number of servers, it should be roughly equivalent to uh, giving a fatter MIG slice for, for the inference use case. Uh, we'll have to see with the training and notebooks uh, what people will need. My, ex my expectation is it's it's going to be more about memory than about the, the number of virtual uh, GPU cores. But we have to see. This is a you know, as Lindsay said, we the facility is uh, uh, you know we're we're in production, but it's still a lot of obviously a lot of things we're doing is R and D. We you know we don't really know yet until people really start using it and then we'll have to optimize the uh, what makes sense. So maybe I missed it, but is there any um, metric of the the impact of using the Triton server as opposed to doing everything locally? I mean, if you had your A100 sitting on your local machine and you're running everything completely locally, what type of difference in performance is there by pushing something out to Triton as opposed to doing it all in the same place? I, I probably not. The best person to uh, to answer that question, I think, is actually Kevin, uh, since he's done tests like this or uh, has the comparative data from uh, CMSSW jobs. There is, of course, some overhead from uh, packing everything and transmitting it over the network, but it also frees or one it makes your, it makes your scheduling a lot easier because instead of uh, having to allocate the GPU resources to users, you're uh, uh, talking about uh, having a stack of scalable GPUs that are managed in a separate way. So there are some ways that it refactorizes the problem that are very advantageous, but I'll give it over to Kevin. Yeah, so I think when you think about overhead, there's a few different categories. Um, as long as you said, there's some overhead from packing and, and you know sending things through the uh, gRPC request. That's really pretty small. Um, just that overhead, you know, and packaging itself tends not to matter that much. Um, the latency of transmission over the network can be a more noticeable factor, you know, for the case that we're discussing here, where all these things are living on the elastic analysis facility, or at least at Fermilab, uh, is going to be pretty small as well. Uh, and you can, in the way we use it in CMS, is that we do everything with an asynchronous non blocking call. So at that point, latency is essentially negligible. Uh, you know, it's happening in the background. Your CPU is doing other things. They don't really care. The only time that it becomes an issue is uh, if the only modules left to execute on an event depend on the output of the request that's still going on the GPU, because then it will have to wait, or maybe it tries to figure out some other work to do on a different event, but that's not always as efficient. Um, I think for the analysis case, probably you're not going to get that sophisticated, but you know, Triton does have asynchronous requests built in. Um, so 
we could potentially set something up that would even, you know, run uh, the rest of the coffee job <laughs> in parallel with the request, but I don't know if that's really necessary. Um, Lindsay points out it's essentially, yeah, fiber optic light time between two sites. I think on average that's true. It, there is kind of a spread because there can be other traffic on the network and then TCP IP will be optimizing what it chooses to send when, um, which is also another point that another source of latency and, you know, what we, when practice shows up as, as latency, it can be what Claire pointed out that if you get to the point where you're using all the GPU resources that are available, then some of your requests may have to wait uh, and then that will just be sitting there. So in practice, if you're really pushing things, that can be the largest contribution. So in the end, it's really a latency issue as opposed to there's some scaling factor due to everything else. Primarily, yes. And like I said, if it really becomes dominant, then some of that latency can be hidden using an asynchronous mode or, you know, uh, sometimes you may just have to accept it, but it's still probably less than running it on a CPU. Yeah, uh, just as a side comment, <laughs> this will be really interesting for analysis once we get switched over to Awkward 2, since it has significantly better threading properties than, uh, than Awkward 1, and is better about releasing the gill and whatnot. So we could imagine, you know, multiple job or a, a threaded DASP job on a single machine uh, making multiple inference requests and then profiting from the latency hiding that you can do with the uh, asynchronous requests, especially if it uh, gives up the gill while it's doing that. So it's, it's something to think about there. Um, I was wondering, um, currently in the system that you have, is there some sort of fair share, or like some way to distribute the available resources between users? In the, uh, you know, this is, uh, we're running Jupyter with sort of the standard cube spawner. So it's, you know, it's the, uh, not really a concept of fair share uh, at, at the moment. I, I you know, we're, we've been thinking about uh, what, what to do there, but it's, uh, you know, this is, it's always tricky how you handle resource sharing when you're extremely resource constrained, when you're either have too many, so much resources that it doesn't matter or, where it's really resource constrained. So I, I don't I don't think there's a really good answer for that yet, other than just keep adding resources to the pool. You know, we can we can also set things aside for uh, is a multi-tenant facility if someone comes in and and wants to have exclusive access and provides the right the funding and the hardware and, or hardware and so on. Uh, we have those capabilities, but uh, the concept of scheduling priority isn't something that maps so well in this space. Okay, I see. Um, yeah, th there was one sort of particular scenario that might not be very realistic, but that I was curious about then in that context. So if, if I have a job running on some CPUs and then sort of waiting for an inference, if there's no GPUs available, that job is just going to block and wait, right? So I guess there's some scenario where I'm just blocking CPUs, idling and waiting for GPUs to, be, to become available. You probably have many more CPUs than GPUs, so potentially that's not an issue. But yeah, I was just wondering about that. Is there some like yes. fall, fallback where you can do inference actually on CPUs, knowing that it's inefficient, but just to like not get locked? Yeah. So, so just to say from the uh, from the user side, um, that is something that I do see. And um, with the cut base tagger that we were using before, we were scaling things out to four hundred workers. Um, but on my end, using the graph neural network with Triton, I can't scale out to 400 workers because then there's too many inferences and I've maxed out. And then we're just like, a lot of these CPUs are just waiting for uh, uh, the inference to go through. So um, I have, it would be really nice on the user side to know kind of what is the ideal number of workers to use such that we're not just wasting CPUs that are waiting in this queue. Um, but currently there's nothing set up 
in that way. But that is definitely something that I see um, as, as incredibly useful for the users and that I've run into. Yeah, and I can comment further on that, that this is, uh, a, or that's work that's being done in the context of CMSSW right now. <laughs> and since we'll know how that functions uh, in a uh, real, uh, or sorry, in a realistic situation, we can very likely transfer a lot of what we learn in terms of making or spinning up fallback servers or uh, thunking to local CPU inference in one way or another uh, from uh, the use case in production in production jobs in CMSSW to analysis. So uh, that that kind of situation is something that we're uh, th that's essentially just in a less or it just hasn't been looked at yet for analysis, but it's something that's definitely on our radar. So we, at the end of the day, I'd like to, I'd like this to be part of the basic functionality that people can always get their inference done no matter what. Yeah, just to elaborate on that a little bit for those who are interested. Our, our idea, and this is still <laughs> being thought through before it's implemented, is essentially to have a, uh, a bunch of different options of you know okay this request failed maybe it failed because of a timeout or because of an error or something uh once that happens what do you do well you could retry it or you could go somewhere else or you could give up or you know there's all these options so the idea would be to have some kind of schema where you could define okay if the first time it fails i want to retry it. then i want to go to a fallback server then i want to you know fail or maybe you have some other idea in mind if you think you might want to retry twice or you know, and then let that schema be specified with probably some intelligent defaults so that all that would be happening behind the scenes but you wouldn't really know you just say oh i had to wait a little longer this time uh, oh well <laughs> you know and then it, it kind of does it for you that's the idea okay since you you mentioned the the idea of sort of like some fallback server to talk to can i connect Sort of like the Triton server you might now have at Fermilab, and perhaps I have another one sitting somewhere else where there's no firewall in the way. Could you now integrate that? That sort of I provide in some way that also then the model is going to be shared automatically without the user having to think about that kind of stuff. For the model mounting, <laughs> I'm not sure how easy it is. Uh, there's probably some way that you could. You know, tell your servers that here's a model repository I want you to check, and maybe some people would share those. I think there are potentially security concerns because essentially a model repository is telling your server what code to execute, and you might not want to let other people tell your server what code to execute in the general case. Um, but I think you can certainly provide the URL of the server if you want to. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy. So, so the the main model then would be that there's going to be a server per site kind of that the site is going to be be using predominantly and that you just handle everything per site that's what we expect assuming that sites have their own gpus which seems to be what's happening okay thanks so how does triton handle authentication and allocations it doesn't i think that's something we're we're adding on top to the extent that we are and we plan to do more of that I mean, so, I so the way that the way that NVIDIA, you know, when they think about Triton and, and who's using it, they assume that you're some developer and you have an app that tells you if, you know, to use the example from TV, if something's a hot dog or not. Um, <laughs> and then your users are just sending data like a picture and then getting a result from the server. So the the thing that we're doing where you know, our users are sort of hybrid of developers where we're coming up with our own models and deploying them and doing inference, you know, in a more complicated way is a little bit different than the way that NVIDIA classically uses that server. Um, and so I think for things like authentication, uh, you know, if you allow someone to make a request, if you allow someone to upload a model, all those things are, are sort of uh, infrastructure that we're adding on top as we go along.
yeah, I, sh I should add that uh, there is there was an effort in CMS. Uh, CMS actually, there is a I there there was effort that went in and there's successful prototype uh, to you know add uh, uh, a token authentication uh, like in the you know they basically have a, a it's not nginx i think it was running i think it was running their own go server but uh, essentially just uh managing authentication at that layer and the, the front you know having its own front end uh, that's passing on requests after authentication uh there is built-in authentication but like that nvidia did put in some auth but like kevin said i mean it's uh the auth is at the level of sort of the uh you know you if you can you can configure it to accept uh you know certain uh uh uh, Dex, like an X509 uh, certificate, like the crude, the crude uh, uh, version, not not anything sophisticated like we've been doing with the, what we were doing X509 before. So it's, I think there's there's work to happen there, but I think the, at least at the at the prototyping level, some of it's already happened. So if it becomes important, I think it's may not be too hard to integrate that into uh, uh, an overall application. Right, that's on our roadmap, and it, it your know, gRPC has sort of hooks for some of these things, so you can integrate it if you're using the gRPC protocol a little more easily. Um, but yeah, so far it has not been the priority because it's all been kind of in alpha beta mode. All right, uh, thanks a lot um, for for all the discussions so far, we're at the one hour mark, but if there's any last questions or comments, perhaps we can take them then before we close this meeting today. I was slightly curious uh, in, in the last plot that was shown, there was like um, a ever so slightly decaying uh, performance benefit um, as you increase the number of jets that were processed and i don't know if there was any like uh reason for why that was i guess there's some extra overhead like io or something that's kind of going on top of both of them so it's, it's canceling out the the ratio a little bit sorry what um what part are you, are you talking about this section in this middle plot oh sorry the the, the plot the plot above this one the, yeah yeah so there's this ratio in in the second panel how it how it how it decays a little bit as you increase the number of jets only by a short a small amount it looks like but yeah I was just curious if there was a reason for that I haven't thought too much about it um, but I. Yeah, I haven't thought too much about it. I don't know if someone else has a, an idea. I guess I, I naively sort of thought that maybe the more things you do that were, you know, like the more things you're doing with the, the faster inference, then maybe the slightly increased performance you have. Um, right. So yeah. I think that and you think about batching, that's true, but we're not batching at level 5,000 jets. <laughs> so it might just be that right, it's getting right. full. Yeah. yeah, I think it's largely to do with all the overhead of cre uh, creating the requests and uh, essentially taking the list of jets you get in, batching it down to 1,024 slices, mm -hmm. and then probably inefficiently using the GPUs at the end of the lists and things like that. Okay, yeah. yeah because of, every minute memory transfer you're making is uh, just stupendously expensive compared to the the compute so that that drives it yeah okay yeah that makes sense that makes sense okay then perhaps this is a good place to uh, close this meeting for today thank you very much uh, to claire to Lindsay and to Bert for demonstrating um, what you're doing with Triton and for uh, all the discussion here. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. Uh, the recording will go up on YouTube for anyone else who couldn't make it today um, as usual. And yeah, with that, then that's it. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice rest of your day. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.